good afternoon. Uh, good morning to everybody. Are you are you connected? Uh, can you please unmute your, yes. your microphone and uh, also your video? So at least that sort of you're not only some names, but also if good. Good morning, Miss Galea. Good morning, Miss Apolis, and uh, good morning, Mr. Sayag. Could you unmute your microphone and open your video? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Good. Good morning to everybody. Um, just to remind you. This lesson and all the lessons will be recorded uh, simply because uh, if someone comes in to join the classes later on, I then post these on, on YouTube. I have no problem of putting, I hope you don't have problems on being on YouTube and I just, uh, I will, uh, I will um, sort of, uh, and so they're available for access to everybody. Uh, just to point out, I mean, it's uh, the lessons are open, and uh, so anybody. I mean, if we were in presence, anybody could walk in the class and listen to the class. At least this is what the policy is in Italy, and I imagine in most uh, in most countries. Apart from now that we have these limitations, so this is the first uh, uh, indication I want to give to you. Second indication, I'm, as you can understand, Vincenzo Zenozenkovic. I'm professor of comparative law at the Roma Tre University, and I teach uh, also European Union transport law. Next to me on the, um, on the screen is Professor Margherita Colangelo, who also teaches comparative law, but also uh, competition, uh, competition law. Uh, in the in the at the Roma Tre. I don't know if anybody of you is enrolled in also in her class. Uh, we yes, are yes. holding. Uh, huh? Sorry, Aurelie uh, uh, is also Apolis, So her. I mean, you will uh, you have already encountered Professor Colangelo. You will encounter her. Um, uh, we I will be holding most of the lessons, but. Uh, for certain aspects, especially when it comes to issues that are concerned competition, then I will step out and Professor Colangelo will move, uh, will move in. Uh, if you have my mail, you have uh, Professor Colangelo's mail, and so any question you just have to address, um, you address, you send the mail, and we tend to respond rather uh, rather quickly. Um, further information, uh, the, uh, the code, the Zoom code is the same for all the lessons. So uh, you just have to click on that and you just enter it. It's, it's a fixed code. I don't change it every time. Uh, so what I will do, I will schedule the lesson for tomorrow and for the next uh, Friday and so on. But you, I won't be sending you the I won't be sending you the code because the code remains exactly or should remain exactly the same. Then if tomorrow, for example, you or another day you find difficulties, well, we can try to solve them on, uh, online. Um, further information, uh, you have, uh, I trust you have received the syllabus and uh, schedule of the classes uh, with the indication of the topics of the classes and uh, also um, I've sent you the, um, the link for the handbook. The, um, European Union uh, Transport Law. Uh, sorry, comes, does it come wrong way around? No. Well, I, can you read it anyhow? It's, uh, anyhow, it's uh, 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 you can uh, uh, you can download it. You can print it if you want to sort of destroy a few trees in the Amazon uh, in the Amazon forest. Uh, sort of you can you can print it if you want, but um, um, it's uh, it's open access, and so it's it's there, and you can 
do whatever you feel necessary to do. Um, just to give, this is, the, I mean, I've had, and Professor Colangelo too, we've had uh, uh, online lessons last, uh, uh, last semester, the spring semester, and so um, we are quite familiar with uh, online teaching. I don't know how much you are familiar with online teaching, but this is the first uh, time in which European Union transport law is held online. So we are going to try to adapt to this new... Um, uh, which chapters of your book are applicable to the whole? I mean, it's, it's, uh, if you have a look at the book, uh, you just see that uh, the book is, the handbook is rather short, and so the whole, uh, it is 200 pages and uh, very discursive. And, um, and the rest are materials, decisions by the, uh, mostly the European Court of Justice. So the whole, we will, during the, during the, the course, we will analyze the, all the, uh, the topics, uh, um, uh, the topics that are in the, in the book. So not any specific chapters, it's the, it's the handbook and then obviously there's the, there's the appendix, which is the, all the cases, but that, those are, 300, the last 350 pages are just cases. We are focusing on, we are focusing on the handbook. Uh, how, okay. did, uh, how were classes organized when we had in presence uh, uh, lessons? Uh, after sort of the introductory lessons, we, uh, we assigned to a certain amount of students some cases asking them to do a PowerPoint presentation in the classroom. Why a PowerPoint presentation? A, because it, if you read a case and you must summarize it, it uh, enhances your, um, your ability to understand it, to synthesize the content of a decision, to focus on what the important issues are, and this is what the, uh, what a lawyer generally has to do. You have a very long decision and you must extract the substance, the juice of that decision. And so this is the first element. The second element, it's not so much for Galea, whose uh, uh, teaching language is uh, uh, commonly uh, English, but also mostly for Apolis and Asayag, uh, obviously to acquire Mm, to acquire English uh, writing skills, which are not, I mean, English is a lingua franca. Uh, if two people from, one from Argentina, another one from Poland meet, they, they use as lingua franca, obviously, English. So, I mean, it is lawyers. So, I mean, it is part of our, um, of our uh, contemporary skills of any lawyer. So it's important that you acquire these skills. Uh, Miss Galea obviously has the advantage of having her university been living in Malta. Obviously, uh, it is the language of, uh, I would imagine, of most of the classes in, uh, in Malta, maybe except some specific domestic, uh, domestic uh, courses that are in, um, are in Maltese. But um, uh, so this is important. The third aspect, but this obviously we will not have it uh, really in this uh, on online um, classes is public, uh, public speaking, public speech. I mean, not everybody is comfortable in speaking in public. Uh, clearly here you, it's a video, so it's less uh, engaging, but uh, many students find themselves, uh, find it difficult to speak in front of a class, even of uh, 10 uh, other 15 students of a class of their peers. And uh, so that also is a skill that should be acquired. In this case, obviously it is, the class is rather small. I hope more students will join, uh, but um, uh, this is uh, um, obviously, this public speech skill is less, uh, uh, less relevant on online teaching. But the first two elements, presentation, PowerPoint presentations will be kept. And further on, we will be assigning, Professor Colangelo and myself will be assigning to you some cases to present Jenny for the next week, saying on October so-and-so, 
uh, a police will present this case and on October uh, Sayag will present this other case and so on. So just to point out that uh, you will, uh, we will keep this uh, PowerPoint presentation because we believe that it is important for you to acquire these, uh, uh, these skills, which are normal skills of any, any lawyer uses these, whether he's a lawyer in a, in, in a private practice or in a firm or in a public administration or whatever, in a company, you have to do presentations. If there's something new that comes out and you must say, this is the, these are the, these are the main issues that we have concerned some kind of legislation, regulation, uh, decision, and so on. So it's, it's good that you learn how to present uh, things clearly and that they are clear to you and clear also uh, to, the, uh, to the audience. So I think this is more or less, this is more or less the sort of basic uh, introduction to the uh, aspects of the, of the course. I just want to remind you, but this is, you've read this on the web page of the Roma 3, uh, at the Studying Law at Roma 3. Remember that this is, um, uh, attendance is compulsory and that therefore you are, allowed a maximum of seven absences for whatever for whatever reason so just to point out that uh, uh, it is uh, uh, so i will expect to to see you uh, in the classroom so uh, i'll uh, just just an, and to see you means to see you i mean not simply just having your name on the on a black screen uh, so yes, like this, uh, Sayago, you, I, <laughs> for me, you're not, <laughs> you're not there any longer. You're not, you've exited, you've, uh, you've left the class and you've gone, mm, if the cafes are open from, uh, in wherever you are, well, we'll find out soon, Sayag, uh, where he comes from. Um, uh, so, uh, we, Let's see if, yes, I say, yeah, Sorry, back I again, you changed, I see you've changed the background. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, these are the main information. Uh, do you have, Professor Colangelo, do you have uh, further um, information you should give to the students? You must. I'm sorry. No, I think that for the first information, we have already, you have already said everything. I'm, I don't know if they have questions, maybe it could be useful for them to, 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 to ask their question right now so that we can also clarify if there is something not clear. Yes, I would like to hear from the students also uh, where they come from. Obviously, uh, Ms. Galea comes from the University of Malta, and so that's quite obvious. But if you can tell us uh, not only which is your university, but at what level of your um, curriculum you are, if you are in the master's degree or in the bachelor's degree, um, sort of just to understand, and especially when it comes to French students who have a rather uh, complex when it comes to uh, le master, what kind of master they are doing. I mean, I haven't really quite understood what uh, uh, the difference is in the various uh, universities when it comes to laws, uh, master's degrees in law. So if each of you can present yourself and also if you have some questions. Galea, you start. Okay, so I come from Malta. Um, I'm currently in my fourth year of the bachelor degree. Therefore, that means that in my last year of my degree, um, this is the only semester where we can do our Erasmus experience because um, the first three years and even semester two of the fourth year, we have compulsory subjects. Um, our course is totally in English, so we don't, don't, we don't do anything in Maltese. We only um, will do um, courses in Maltese um, in our masters when we are doing the procedure and we have to do legal terminology. But uh, up till now, we have never done anything in Maltese. Okay, that's, that's, that's good. So we learn also some things about the Maltese uh, uh, 
law degree. Uh, Apolis? I come from CY, Sergi Paris University. And uh, I'm between my bachelor degree and my master degree. So I have my bachelor degree, but I am not enrolled in a master degree. And so this is sort of a, why is this? I mean, so you finished your you finished your uh, your bachelor's degree, and uh, uh, and why haven't you start? When do you start your master's degree? Uh, next uh, September twenty twenty one. So this is a some somehow a year in which you are sort of you are you are like a seizure. Hmm. Okay. And when you when, when you enroll in the master's degree, what will uh, what will the uh, focus of the master's degree be on? Uh, I don't know yet. Hmm. I have okay. <laughs> then Asayag. Yes, uh, I'm from France, the, the same university as uh, Aurélie. Sergi Portoise. Uh, exactly. And I'm uh, on my third year of bachelor. And uh, I don't have choose, uh, chosen a, a master yet. And I will see uh, during the, the year. And I'm here for two semesters in Roma. Yeah, OK. But, but you are in Sergi Portoise, I imagine. Or are you in Rome? Uh, it was uh, to do an experience and improve my English and see uh, abroad uh, classes. But where are you now physically? Where are you oh, now? Roma. Roma. Ah, well, well, but at the, for once the situation in Rome is somehow better than in Paris and uh, and uh, and uh, elsewhere. So. Uh, this is a small advantage. We hope we keep this. Uh, we keep this. Uh, um, this. Uh, this situation. We don't move towards uh, uh, French lockdown. We hope that mm -hmm. you can you can enjoy a little bit, not much, but a little bit of Rome. Uh, Rome life. Okay. So if that is it, I can. Uh, um, Professor Colangelo can is free to leave the, the this class, and uh, we shall. Uh, uh, I will generally be sitting in class, but for some uh, specific uh, topics, uh, uh, Professor Colangelo will be given a lesson. But I will I will send you an email saying tomorrow or next week uh, the lesson will be held by Professor Colangelo. Arrivederci. Thank you very much. Bye. Goodbye to everybody. Bye. OK. Uh, now, um, what uh, um, I will be doing is um, using quite a lot of slides. Uh, just consider that the handbook you have really starts as a uh, um, development of a course that was organized that Professor Colangelo and myself organized around slides. And then we, when we reached 250 slides, we decided that it was too, it was too complex and we, we wrote the handbook, we put it in the handbook. So, uh, but we will, so these slides somehow are the summary, a very uh, synthetic uh, summary of the, of the um, uh, of what you find in the textbook, which on the other hand is uh, uh, quite small, it's only two hundred pages. Uh, there is one uh, notice I must give um, beforehand. Nobody, nobody, nobody uh, is able uh, to know what will what preserves us the future, um, in the sense that the uh, uh, pandemic and all the various restrictions have hit in the first place uh, travel and uh, what was quite ordinary last year in this class they were um, oh, 15 students coming from all around Europe coming from Portugal uh, and also 
outside Europe, from Brazil. Uh, I've had students from uh, Uzbekistan or um, from uh, Estonia, from Spain, from France, Belgium, Netherlands, and all around Europe. They were all in Rome because uh, obviously Rome is an attractive place and hopefully also the, the classes are interesting. Uh, this is uh, no longer possible and this has hit uh, my travel, has hit obviously the Erasmus program. And so I will um, present to you uh, what uh, the EU transport law was until let's say January 2020. And then at the end, I will sort of indicate what are the um, sort of the, at the verse, uh, towards the end of the class, I will indicate what, uh, um, what are the significant changes that have occurred and that maybe are there to stay in, uh, uh, in European Union uh, uh, travel um, uh, legislation. Uh, for the moment, it is really uh, wait and see because, uh, I mean, uh, every day there's something new, for example, establishing that citizens that are coming from France to Italy must all undergo certain limitations or then no passengers are allowed from certain countries and so on. So it is quite impossible to establish uh, today um, what the state of the legislation is, because it really changes, especially when it comes to when it comes to um, when it comes to air transport. Uh, it, the, things are changing every day. So uh, you will forgive me if I'm presenting to you um, a picture which is today abstract and hopefully will become instead a uh, return when if we re we hopefully return to normality uh, it will become the uh, the ordinary system uh, of european transport as it was uh, um, before the uh, the pandemic uh, just to point out the effects of the pandemic are they have been very s significant not only on the status of EU legislation on the application of EU legislation as it was, but has also frozen a whole lot of very important changes in the field of air transport and of rail transport that should have been enacted in 2020 and which obviously have not been able, they have not been enacted. Just to point out that hopefully if uh, by uh, towards the end of November, we see that things are somehow normalizing well, then we can sort of get the, and indicate what are the shifts in the future shifts. So this is the first point I wanted to uh, make. Second, I have a question for you. Um, in your classes, had you already taken European Union law? Galea, yes. Apolis, no. Asayag, a police, how is it? Chergy Pontoise, you should have taken European, rather l'Union Européenne, haven't you? Haven't you taken? Uh, no, I was, well, I didn't, I uh, was not obliged to, because um, I did an um, Anglo American degree. Mm. So uh, some French courses I didn't have. European Union law. Okay, just to point out, no, just to find out, to see what. What is the a common basis? I mean, it's important, you know, uh, when you have students that come from different uh, countries, obviously they have a different curriculum, a different background. So obviously I must somehow fit and take into account what is their knowledge. In many cases, I've had uh, non-European students, I've had American students, I've told you from Uzbekistan or from Brazil, and obviously they were not familiar with EU law. And so this required somehow um, sort of giving some supplement. So I will, you know, what I will do now is sort of give you um, some uh, brief introductory pills 
on sort of the framework of the uh, European uh, of European Union law, in which, and this is the framework in which we will insert um, uh, European Union transport law, which is a part of uh, uh, obviously of EU law. Now, let me just um, find my slides. Um, here we are. Um, let me see if can you see my can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. I just um, just to be sure they generally work. Yes. Okay. Then why is this? Well, anyhow. Um, now. It all starts uh, for you ages ago. For me, uh, I mean, it is much more present. I mean, it starts at the mid of last century, in which, uh, when in March uh, 1957 in Rome, in the Campidoglio, the capital, uh, the Rome Treaty was uh, signed. The Rome Treaty is uh, the basis of the European Union. It was at that time and mostly focused on economic cooperation between six countries, three big countries, France, Germany, and Italy, and three small countries, Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg. Um, it was uh, an economic, it was called the European economic community and so the economic was underlined and so it was basically on forms of, uh, of economic cooperation but there in the Rome Treaty which we shall see has been uh, subsequently uh, substituted by the Lisbon Treaty 50 years later um, we find uh, these four fundamental freedoms. Now, these four fundamental freedoms are essential in the field of transport law, but obviously uh, they are essential in all uh, European Union activities. So it's not only they, I mentioned them because they are the pillars on which uh, the European Union has uh, grown and that are at the basis of also of European Union transport law. So these four fundamental freedoms are the free movement of goods. Uh, the community shall be based upon a customs union which shall cover all trading goods and which shall involve the prohibition between member states of custom duties on imports and exports and of all charges having equivalent effect and adoption of a common customs tariff in their relation with third countries. Now this is, fundamental as you can imagine for transport, because uh, obviously when you eliminate customs duties, you favor, uh, you favor uh, transnational, transborder uh, transport of goods, free movement of goods. So this means that at that time in 1957, this meant that cars built in Italy or Germany or France could circulate and go, be sold without any uh, without any customs in other other member states of the uh, European community of that time, and uh, any kind of product, obviously we are talking of goods. Therefore, physical goods have to be transported, and so this gave enormous uh, push towards uh, uh, European trade, uh, intra-European trade. So, just to point out that uh, obviously, when we talk about goods. Uh, uh, we mean that goods generally need to be uh, shifted from the place of production to the place of where they are consumed, their consumption. And so this requires a certain amount of transport. I will, during the class, we shall not focus on transport of goods, but just to point out that this is uh, free transport of goods, elimination of custom duties. That means that uh, you don't have to spend time uh, at, uh, uh, at uh, customs at the frontier to verify and to pay customs. This means speeding up and you find uh, lorries, planes, uh, ships that go from one country to another and load and unload 
and without any formality, which means enormous push towards uh, European transport and European transport has been developing a lot. Second point, free movement of persons, freedom of movement for workers shall be secured within the community by the end of, of the traditional period at, la at la latest. Now, this uh, formally is, uh, uh, obviously, it speaks of workers. You must think that in 1957, there was a great deal need of, of, um, of uh, um, uh, workers, especially in certain countries, especially uh, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, less the Netherlands, Germany, which were, um, there was a whole lot of immigration, especially from Italy. Italy, during those years, if, if you look at um, France, you will find that many of those who have an Italian name are emigrated to uh, France in those years, in the late 50s and, uh, and the 60s. So it was originally meant for workers, but, and this is why we are interested in transport, it meant also, and now it means uh, a whole lot of free movement, not only of workers, but of people. So, I mean, uh, now Asayagi is in Rome, but you, the, the so-called Schengen Treaty means free movement of people. And this is the reason why when there was no uh, sanitary restrictions, any, anybody could move very easily throughout Europe with a few exceptions, typically the UK, uh, without any border controls, without any uh, documents except the document you had to show at, uh, at, uh, uh, at the departure gate just to identify you and to be sure that the hold of the, of the ticket was the same person that was boarding the plane. But uh, so free movement of, per of persons has meant progressively not only workers, but anybody for any reason, tourism, family reasons, health reasons, and obviously students. So, and this has incredibly enhanced uh, transport because clearly uh, if we're talking of free movement of persons, these persons move about and they use means of transport. They could use their own means of transport, their car, but mostly they have been using, especially in these last years, uh, planes or trains. So just to point out that this is, again, another of the fu uh, fundamental freedom freedoms that is uh, very important in the area of transport. Free movement of services, and this is the focus, the main focus that we are interested in. Remember that the transport is from an economic point of view and therefore from a legal point of view is a service. So um, you should have clear the distinction between a good and a service. When I buy a car, the car belongs to me and it is therefore uh, I am um, sort of the owner, I become the owner of the car. When I buy a ticket for a plane from Paris to Rome or vice versa, I'm not buying, nor the plane, obviously, but nor the seat, the seat is not mine. I'm offered a service. That is transport service from one place, from point A to point B. So this is the uh, uh, very important, you easily understand that transport, when we talk about free movement of services, uh, this is uh, essential. And uh, when the mm, Article 59 established that freedom to provide services, uh, that is that you could provide services throughout the community, uh, this meant that you could provide services, whatever services, in any country. If you were established in Italy, you could provide services in France or in Germany and vice versa in any of the other members of the community. Uh, we shall see, however, that this what well, there was a significant exception for transport. But just to point out that when it comes to free movement of services, transport is a service, and therefore it is falls perfectly within the third freedom. The fourth is free movement of capital within the framework of provisions, uh, restrictions uh, on the freedom of establishment of nationals of a member state in the territory of another member state shall be abolished. So what does this mean? Uh, before the Rome Treaty, it was somehow difficult, especially in certain areas, for nationals of a different country 
to establish a company in a different country, in another country. So if you were a French citizen, you could not, let's say, open a, a petrol and oil company in Italy because it was considered strategic or telecommunications company. And so there were limitations on free movement of capital. So you wanted to, you had, you were German and you had lots of money and you said, I would like to all have a company in France or in Netherlands or in Italy and there were restrictions and so you were not allowed to hold this uh, to own a company if you were a German national or a German company you did, could not own control a company in a different country now with uh, a default freedom these restrictions were limited and therefore this meant that obviously um, firms mostly firms, we're talking of firms, uh, which have required significant capital, could establish their own companies in another country. If you think of this, of, of, um, of in the field of transport, you can imagine that it might be convenient for someone to open a company, to have a transport company in a different country than that of origin, to have you are um, sort of uh, uh, a German company, but you want to open uh, another company in, for transport in Eastern Europe because you want to serve uh, Central and Eastern Europe and also uh, beyond the European Union. Therefore, you want to be based in Romania, Poland or Estonia and uh, you open a company there to serve that area and the neighboring areas. So again, this is the four freedoms. So if you, we look at these four fundamental freedoms on which the European community at that time, the European Union now, has grown throughout these um, 60, over 60 years, we see that they all are relevant for, um, relevant uh, in the field of transport. They have implications in the field of transport. We shall see, however, let me go on. That there are special provisions for transport because the Article 61 of the Rome Treaty, and we shall see this. Sorry, just let me move this. Let's see if I can move this. Um, Article 61 of the Rome Treaty said that freedom to provide services in the field of transport should be governed by provisions of the title relating to transport. So what we find, we find these four very important freedoms and immediately we find an exception. And this exception was very, very mm, rigid and substantially was meant to keep uh, uh, transport services under the control of member states. So when the member states, the six member states of the Rome that signed the Rome Treaty in 1957 signed it, they sort of, they wanted to keep transport under a special regime and national regime. And therefore each country uh, supposedly went on its own, according to its own rules. Uh, so what do we find, and here we have, I rem remind you, we're still looking at the Rome Treaty. Now things have changed, but they've changed owing to certain um, significant um, uh, interventions, judicial interventions, which we will analyze in detail and maybe uh, you will present them uh, in, uh, uh, to the class. Uh, originally, uh, the transport was kept out of the sort of the general principles of freedom of the four fundamental freedoms and especially the freedom to provide services uh, under title, this title number four, transport, article 74 to 84, um, and which had these 11 articles uh, contain many of the principles in the field of transport. And we shall see that when we are looking at uh, sort of the uh, 
the articles that regulate transport in the Lisbon Treaty, articles from 90 to 100, they are very similar, but with a one main difference, which we shall see in, in due course. So what do these articles, what is the origin? We look at the origin because just, remind, just to remind you, the law, uh, you understand the law only if you sort of see where it comes from and you understand where it will go. Uh, legal provisions don't fall, sort of they're not meta rights that come from the sky. They are developed through time and through need, through circumstances, and therefore you have to, we have to look at the origins of the uh, Rome Treaty because then we understand very well where we are standing, where we are standing today and how things have changed over these last uh, 60 years. So what does these articles 74 to 84 establish? A common transport policy, therefore from a policy point of view there should be a common transport policy which means simply that um, that uh, uh, the, the political um, institutions of the European uh, community, the Council and the Commission had to um, establish a common transport policy that they were, they should establish also common rules applicable to international transport, that is transport outside the European community. Um, which uh, are the conditions under which non-resident carriers may operate transport services within a member state. Just think of a French uh, truck company. To what extent a French truck company can provide services in Italy to Italian clients within Italy, uh, not only transport between Italy and France, but also inside Italy. So the problem of freedom to provide certain services. And, uh, and this is very important, the second bullet point, please keep in mind because it is central in any uh, transport legislation, at least at the European level, one must consider if principles of the regulatory system for transport could have a serious effect on the standard of living and on employment in certain areas and on the operation of transport facilities. Now this seems to you, it may seem something completely abstract without uh, much sense. I will put it into context. Uh, first of all, please consider that uh, the uh, transport sector is um, quite what we may call labor intensive. That is uh, a sector where obviously you can uh, automize, use machines for uh, certain operations. Just think of loading and unloading a ship, just to make an example. Uh, but it is, uh, uh, for many of its activities, you require people, employees. And therefore, there are uh, many uh transport companies are um, labor intensive and in certain countries and the example typical example is france uh, these uh, uh, these companies are not only labor intensive but they are very much unionized and trade unions have a very strong role just think in france the, and our French students will understand this immediately. The so-called cheminots. Cheminots are the railway workers who are very much unionized. And if they strike, that means the par paralysis of France. And this happens quite often, uh, has happened in the past, in which um, until the lockdown period, in which it was quite regular that uh, sort of the, the, the trade unions were sort of for one reason or another, we're not entering that would uh, block the whole of France, the whole rail uh, system, which is very developed in France, and there was no rail transport in, in France going. So um, this is, uh, uh, so what does this mean? 
uh, when he says employment in certain areas. This means, well, it means uh, what does uh, uh, policies should take into account also the role of employment. And so when you want to, and we shall see when we are talking about liberalization uh, of, um, of uh, transport services, well, what is the effect of liberalization on employment? on the number of employees and on the conditions of working, the contractual conditions of workers. So this is the first element. The second element, which is when he says, serious effect on the standard of living in certain areas. Now, uh, please keep in mind that transport is uh, something, is a service which obviously generally serves uh, private interest as uh, you order something on Amazon uh, without moving from your room, uh, but then there's someone who must collect this, uh, this uh, um, uh, the parcel from an Amazon warehouse and bring it to you and deliver it to you. So there's a transport service or very simply, there are goods that think of, uh, of food uh, that must be moved from one part to another of Europe or any other, or people who have to move for um, working reasons, for pleasure reasons, whatever, they have to move from, they have or want to move from one part or another of the country. Now this has a very important social impact. If you live in a, uh, in a big town which has an airport or more airports, has uh, railways, has uh, motorways, well, you're well connected with uh, the rest of uh, the country or other countries. If you're in Paris, you can, when there are no restrictions, in two hours you're in London, and in two hours you are in Amsterdam, and you move around, in two hours you are in, in Lyon, and so on. You can You can move very easily, by train or by plane uh, and so on. And this has very important social effects. I mean, before the lockdown, it was quite common people saying, people like you saying, oh, well, let's go this weekend. We'll, we'll go to Barcelona. It costs 39 euros uh, and we'll fly there and we'll have a nice time in Barcelona. And uh, that is a part of uh, sort of social uh, social effects of, uh, of freedom of, of transport. So the important, what does this provision say? It is telling us that when we look at transport policies, we should not look only at what is an essential aspect, which is the profitability of certain activities, because obviously we feel that certain activities should be run in an economic uh, framework and therefore it should be sort of whoever runs it should make should be able to make a profit out of this but at the same time we must look at the what are the social consequences if you start saying the railway company whether it is Société Nationale Chemin de Fer just to point out all Europe has railways except two countries Cyprus and Malta so when we talk about railways, obviously our Maltese student will somehow be looking at this as something strange, but just to point out. But anyhow, just think of uh, uh, a railway company, Société Nationale Chemin de Fer or uh, Bundesbahn or Ferrovia dello Stato. They must say they have their spending too much money and they say, we must cut certain lines. These lines are uh, sort of peripheral lines. They are very few passengers and therefore they are not profitable, they cost a lot, and we are losing lots of money. Uh, the answer is, well, does this have a serious effect on the standard of living in certain areas? I live in a peripheral area, and my only way to connect, be connected to the central or to important parts of the country is through this, through this railway. If there's no railway, I would have to take the car myself and obviously it would cost too much. So just to keep in mind that uh, when we are looking at constantly, when we're looking at European Union transport law, we shall also be looking at certain, some social issues, which are interesting because they, uh, mm, not for some uh, sort of uh, uh, philosophical reason, but, but because they have a, Consequences on the legislation. So we shall see that certain pieces of EU 
a transport law are influenced by social needs and therefore the need to ensure uh, connection between, especially between peripheral areas and the center of the of a country or between areas which are just think in um, Portugal or uh, Portugal and Spain that have these islands which are in the Atlantic and which are very distant from the mainland and Madeira, Azores, uh, Canary Islands. And if you do not ensure um, transport, air transport uh, from these uh, uh, islands, obviously all the citizens, those who live there are unable to reach the mainland. This has very important social effects or just think of Greece and the hundreds of islands in Greece and, uh, and how difficult it is for the, these islanders to get to a main uh, town, Athens or uh, Saloniko, uh, just to point out that so the consequences, social consequences, just to point out that we will be talking about law but, and economic aspects of transport, uh, but also of social uh, social aspects of uh, of transport. Then, principle of non-discrimination, and this is quite clear, it is embedded in the notion of European Union law that there should be no discrimination between carriers and carriers of other member states. So once you allow that carriers, let's take typically trucks that are lorries that have to transport goods from one country to another, from Germany to France, or from Italy to France, obviously you cannot do discrimination between national carriers and carriers of the member states. What could this dis discrimination be? Saying, for example, that certain goods can only be carried by certain carriers, national carriers, or establishing certain procedures, complex procedures for non-national, uh, non national carriers, making it more difficult for them to operate. And um, yeah, the second bullet point is very important because we shall analyze this in detail. State aid, we shall see the principles in state aid, is compatible if it means, meets the needs of coordination of transport or represents reimbursement for the discharge of certain public service obligations. For the moment, public service obligation shorthand PSO is something that you have uh, for you is very vague. We shall analyze in detail public service obligations because we shall see that many of our transport system, typically local transport, just think of commuters that go, um, go from the from peripheral zone to the center, from La Banlieue to central Paris, or uh, local transport, uh, well, we will see that this is under public service obligations. We shall see this further on when we're looking at this. But it's saying there's already an exception saying, listen, you can put money in certain activities if they provide uh, public service obligations. And typically, public service obligations are, for example, the fact that buses in a town in the capital should be running all night. How many passengers are there on this bus? One passenger, two passengers? Quite irrelevant. We're not going to look at the profitability of that service. That is a public service obligation. Buses must run all night because notwithstanding the, the cost of it, because that is a public service obligation, that it is felt that the community should have public transport, not only during the day, but also during the night. So just to point out typical public service obligation, which we shall analyze in detail. Then, uh, again, and we are still analyzing articles between 74 and 84 of the, um, of the um, uh, Rome Treaty, measures concerning transport rates and conditions must take account of the economic circumstances of carriers. What does this mean? If we look at transport, we see that transport from an economic point of view is a, a very a varied um, economic sector. We find some very big carriers, just think of air transport. We have very big uh, air companies, Air France, Lufthansa, British Airways, 
and uh, various mix uh, sort of uh, Air France's KLM and British Airways is Iberia. So, I mean, we find very big companies. Then we find also very small companies. Just think of companies that are providing uh, that are providing um, uh, transport of goods often uh, from one country to another. You see these lorries going around, and generally you see that they're very small companies. Maybe it's a one one person that owns the driver that owns the lorry, and he's the he's a one man company, or anyhow a small company with 10, 15 employees between you. So you have companies that have thousands of employees and companies that have no employees or they're self-employed or just think of small ferry boats that carry um, inhabitants and tourists from the mainland to a Greek island. Very small uh, ferry boats uh, which have uh, one owner, one boat and that's it. So very, very small enterprises. So we must distinguish what is it, what is the treaty telling us. When we are sort of fixing rules in transport, well, we have to take into account what is the economic background. If we are regulating uh, companies which are very big, just think of uh, Société Nationale Chemin de Fer that has, well, 80,000 employees, or we are regulating a very small company, transport company, uh, which is providing uh, transport, has one lorry, two lorries, or one bus or two buses uh, for um, um, uh, charter buses going around tourists. So just, just to show you that we must look at the size of the company. And uh, obviously you cannot uh, apply this to the principle of discrimination, different conditions for the carriage of the same goods over the same transport links on grounds of the country of origin or destination of the goods. So again, a specification of the principle of non-discrimination. We will not focus this concerns mostly uh, transport of goods. We shall see that there can be some distinctions uh, for transport of persons especially when we have remote areas. So if I am a citizen of the Canary Islands, I will have a reduced rate to transport to go from uh, the, the Canary Islands to mainland Spain. But if I'm a tourist, I will have a pay a full rate. But this is, it is explained on social, uh, uh, social reasons. An inhabitant, a resident has different social needs than a tourist. A tourist, obviously, if he's going to, he or she is going to the Canary Islands, well, uh, should be able to pay the full price of the ticket. And uh, <clears throat> uh, principle, this is again connected to the principle of state aid, rates and conditions involving any element of support or protection in the interest of one or more particular undertakings or industries are prohibited. We shall see this, or rather you shall see it, particularly with Professor uh, Colangelo, when we analyze what are the competition implications, the applications of Article 101 and 102 uh, in the field of, um, of, um, of uh, transport. And appropriate regional econ economic policy to meet the needs of undeveloped areas. I mean, we have maybe Malta is rather in a small country and quite compact, well, um, has less than, it is in a country which is distant and has, the whole country has these needs. But in other uh, countries, we have, uh, Areas which are underdeveloped, let's think of France in respect of uh, Corsica, for example, or uh, let's think of Italy and southern Italy or certain islands of, uh, uh, in Italy, not only Sardinia, but other islands which are not easily, uh, easily reached. And so uh, the problem of the importance of transport for underdeveloped areas, how to promote transport, because generally, generally, not always, but generally speaking, we see that if you have infrastructures and transport infrastructures, this helps the development of certain, 
of certain areas of the country. And certain areas of the country are underdeveloped because they do not have transport facilities, because they have no motorways, because the airport is very distant, uh, because a whole of them, the ports are not functional and so on. So just to point out that this is the very um, important aspect. And finally, um, when it comes to, uh, well, this is again the principle of, um, um, uh, of non-discrimination, charges are due in respect of the crossing of frontiers charged by a carrier, in addition to the transport rate shall not exceed a reasonable level. So this is again the principle of proportionality and non-discrimination. And uh, this is the focus. This Article 84 is the, somehow the stumbling block of uh, European transport law that was removed very with great difficulty by a certain number of decisions of the European Court of Justice, which we shall analyze in detail. But this is the real, uh, somehow, the stumbling block of uh, liberalization and full application of the four fundamental freedoms to transport, in particular, uh, the freedom to provide services. What did Article 84, Article 84 now is repealed, and we shall see what Article 100 of the Lisbon Treaty says, which is significantly different. But this is, Article 84 was somehow the, the gate, the floodgate, which prevented liberalization and competition in the field of transport activities in Europe. Uh, provisions of this title shall apply to rail, road, and inland waterways. So we see that these are means of transport. Rail, okay, that's clear. Road, that's clear. Inland waterway is something that we find mostly in sort of European countries, France's lot, but especially if we look at Belgium, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, uh, well, uh, inland waterway is very important and also partly is also for Central Europe from uh, inland waterway. I mean, the development of two very important ports, one of two of the most important ports um, in Europe, that is Antwerp in Belgium and Rotterdam, in the Netherlands is due to the fact that they have the rivers that reach there allow to unload in that, those ports a whole lot of, of goods and then to move them. And uh, uh, in ancient times, there were no motorways, railways and so on. And so you move them to inland waterway through rivers or canals. And the same somehow is important for uh, Central Europe from the Danube that goes, uh, that moves uh, north uh, from the Black Sea, uh, from Varna, uh, um, and moves and uh, moves north from the, the Danube Delta, moves north and then brings can carry uh, products up to uh, Central uh, Central European countries. Uh, just consider the Danube touches more or less five five capitals in the. In, the, in that area. So it is a very important inland waterway. But so Article 84 says these provisions that we have said, which are exceptional provisions, apply to rail, road, and inland waterway. Okay. The council, and that is the highest political institution of the European Union, there's the council, then there's the commission. At that time in 1957, the parliament was non existent may acting unanimously, so just keep in mind this unanimity, decide whether to what extent and by what procedure appropriate provisions may be laid down for sea and air transport. So it is saying that what Title IV applies only to railroad and inland waterway. When it comes to sea and air transport, all at that time six countries had to be agreed completely on the provision. Now, obviously, six countries, maybe you could get them together, but when countries become 10, then they become 12, 15, 20, uh, 27, well, unanimity is quite impossible. 
uh, because everybody has different different interests. Sea and air transport, uh, sea because of uh, uh, traditional maritime rules that existed since the Middle Ages, uh, especially in the Mediterranean. We find them in uh, Venice, Genoa, but also uh, France and and Barcelona. Barcelona was had very strong Consulado del Mar had all, all rules that were very important in the Mediterranean. And then when when the new world is discovered, then we see the great development of maritime rules uh, moving from the countries that are on the North Sea uh, to Netherlands and uh, and Great Britain. Uh, so sea is not is outside of Title IV and air transport. Why? Because at that time, we're talking about 1957, all air count lines were state-owned. So France had Air France, it still has Air France. Germany had and still has Lufthansa. Uh, Belgium had, has no longer uh, Sabena. Uh, Netherlands had uh, KLM and still has KLM. Luxembourg only recently has set up its own air company and Italy had Alitalia had and no longer has it, that is state owned. But at that time, air companies were state owned. So the state said, well, this is my business. I will regulate my own, my, I will regulate Air France, Lufthansa, Italia, KLM. It's my business. And I don't want the European Union to meddle, European community to meddle with the regulation of air transport in my country. This is the, so <clears throat> this article 84 essentially is telling us that these Special provisions apply, Title IV apply to railroad and inland waterway. They do not apply to sea and air transport. And they, if there are any rules that should apply to uh, sea and, uh, and air transport, they can be applied only on the basis of a unanimous decision of the Council. So just to point out how restrictive the Rome Treaty was towards transport. And the effects of this was that substantially the transport sector was, while other sectors had a great development, just think of the automobile industry of, the, of other industries where sort of they were producing or um, other kinds of electronics, uh, refrigerators, washing machines, uh, uh, televisions, and uh, other kinds of uh, High uh, high tech uh, machinery or other kinds of products. They was they were moving around Europe and they were selling this and that. And other services could be somehow provided on uh, um, sort of an easier basis. When it came to transport, this was very much under the control of the member states. And member states did not want to relinquish their uh, control over uh, transport. So this is, these are the origins. We shall see how we have moved from these origins towards uh, uh, a very, very different scenario, uh, but also from, uh, uh, from not only from a legal perspective in the Lisbon Treaty of 2007, but uh, also from uh, an economic and social uh, perspective. So this is the past. Let's see how things have changed in the Lisbon Treaty. Lisbon Treaty, I written 2009 because they enter in force, into force in December uh, 2009, but they were signed in 2007, so 50 years after the Rome Treaty. Um, so, what is the uh, what are the principles? Just to remind our students who have taken European Union law and those who have not taken uh, European Union law that the Lisbon, the, so the fundamental, we have three texts which are the basis of the European Union. We have the Treaty of the European Union, we have the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and then we have the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. These three documents are the basis of, let's say, the Constitution, I'll use it, Constitution, quote unquote, uh, of the European Union. So uh, we find that the provisions on transport 
we find them in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Treaty of the European Union is mostly an international treaty between the members of that, uh, who signed that treaty at that time, 28, now uh, 27, so member states, and that set the general principles of the European Union, and then the specification of the various aspects, especially of the policies, are in the treaty for the functioning of the European Union. So let's look at the treaty on the functioning of the European Union. Article 4, shared competence between the Union and member states applies to the transport sector. So what does this mean? It means that shared competence means that uh, when there is a decision that has to be taken in the field of transport by a member state, well, it, this member state must somehow um, coordinate itself with the, uh, with the, um, with the union. Uh, you, there will be further on, um, Further in the course, uh, Professor Colangio will present to you the case of Uber. Uh, substantially, you could say Uber is local transport. It is, uh, well, some kind of uh, taxi um, in urban taxi. Um, so it is only local. Um, well, local, but when the platform is, uh, uh, you can, the Uber platform is uh, all throughout Europe, is it local? So we are interested in sort of shared competence. So it's not only a decision for Rome or Paris or Madrid or Berlin to decide whether to admit or not admit and under what conditions Uber, I'm just making this example, uh, but it is somehow, it is also the interest of the, uh, it is a shared competence. And so there's an interest also of the uh, European Union. Just to show you what we mean by uh, shared competence. So what might appear to be a purely local issue, uh, well, might have instead um, for the size, for the importance of the, this kind of transport, uh, well, it might interest also the European Union. The European Union is not interested in sort of ferry services between um, Athens and some uh, island in the Aegean, but is interested instead on, well, air transport between Athens and various islands, Crete, uh, Rhodes, and so on in the, in the, in the, um, in Greece. So just to point out that we have to look at the size of the problem. Now, uh, just to say, we have looked at the provisions from Article 74 to 84 of the, um, of the Rome Treaty, we shall see that most of these provisions, most of them, we find them repeated in the, uh, in the Lisbon Treaty. So there hasn't been, from a black letter point of view, the text doesn't seem substantially the same. If we compare the text of 1957 and the text of 2007, we find it more or less they are the same words. The problem is that, and this is very important for us lawyers, we must remember that we must always put these, the, the, law, the words of the law, we must put them into a context. And so in 1957, these words meant something. In 2007, they mean something different. So just to show you that you can describe, you can regulate the same phenomenon, or rather, a phenomenon using the same words, but um, the, uh, the sort of the consequences of these words are different for, um, uh, from a very practical point of view. So here we see that Article 57, for example, freedom to provide services in the field of transport shall be governed by the provisions of the title relating to, the tran to transport. So more or less the same text as Article 61, only that in Article 61 of the, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the Rome Treaty, it was meant as closing provision. Here it is much more open and has very more different, has a different consequences because things have, in 50 years, have changed radically. And so, 
Article 90, objectives of the treaties shall in matters governed by this title, that is, it is title no longer Title 4, but Title 60, be pursued between the framework of a common transport policy. Um, again, if we look at the Article 91, I won't go, I just, you do, then I'll be sending you the slides. So um, it's more or less uh, the same text of um, that we found in articles uh, from uh, 74 to 83. Um, what is, where do things substantially change? So just let's go, just let me go back one second to Article 84. So what did Article 84 say? It's for Article 61 said that the transport is regulated by the specific title. The title says it is applied only to railroad and inland waterway, and only if the council unanimously decides so, certain rules could be applied throughout the European community to sea and air transport. So as you see, that very there's a, an exception, Article 61 says Title 4, and within this exception, it says only this, we are applying only to this, sea and air transport, it is left to the member states, or at least this is what the member states thought they were signing. When they signed this the treaty in Rome, they were convinced that, well, uh, um, that sea and air transport was a specific national, um, uh, a national uh, uh, left to national legislation, it was left to the member states to decide how to regulate sea and air transport. Nothing to do with the European community. Now, if we look at Article 100, of the Lisbon Treaty, first paragraph says, provision of this title shall apply to railroad and inland water. Same, okay. Paragraph two, the European Parliament and the Council acting into accordance with the ordinary legislative procedure may lay down appropriate provisions for sea and air transport. What is the ordinary legislative procedure? Very simply, majority. So, and I won't enter here the problem of how you create majorities within within the European, which is somehow complex because it's number of states and also the size of the states. Because if four big states, let's say Italy, uh, France, Germany, and Spain, group together and they are very heavy, then they cannot, although they have a majority of voting uh, uh, weight. In, in, the, in the system, they cannot because they have, do not have a number. But even if, uh, let's say, uh, 14 small countries, let's say Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Luxembourg, uh, Malta, Cyprus, uh, Portugal, uh, Bulgaria, let's say, let's imagine the, the uh, 14 smallest country group together, they do not form a majority because you need also a majority of the weight of the country. But, we won't enter into this, but just the important thing is paragraph two of uh, the Lisbon Treaty wipes away the principle of unanimity and says ordinary legislative procedure and therefore simple majority. So this is very important because it changes completely the system. Uh, uh, clearly in a 27 member uh, community a union, um, Unanimity is very, very, very difficult. A majority instead is something that happens quite often. And we find quite often that there are decisions taken with a majority and not unanimously. So just to point out that this is the main change. It seems, you know, mm, of a limited importance, but we shall see that in the meantime, between 1957 and 2007, a whole lot of new things have happened. And, and uh, the scenario in which 
these provisions have to be applied is completely different from an economic, social, and uh, political uh, context. Um, so this is the uh, the sort of the main um, focus we are doing on the European Union and on its uh, um, specific uh, uh, provision. We shall see further on uh, when we look at this, um, certain aspects, mostly Article 101 and 102 on competition and Articles uh, 106 and 107 on state A, which are very important. I just say here yeah, something I will repeat continuously. Competition and state aid are two faces of the same coin. You cannot divide them. If you have a euro coin, you can't just cut one face and say this is the one face and uh, I'm not interested in another. Competition and state aid are two faces of the same coin and you must always analyze them to see to what extent competition is allowed and to what extent state aid is allowed. And to find, understand what the balance of what the balance is. Uh, so we shall find other provisions, but substantially what we are interested in uh, is when Article 100 uh second paragraph establishes that there is an ordinary legislative procedure this means that transport policy in the european union is taken at uh with a simple with a simple majority uh, generally speaking we see that the decisions are generally taken with a very very large majority because uh clearly uh, certain countries uh, are more interested in certain forms of transport. Uh, uh, typically, sort of, let's imagine Greece. Greece obviously is very interested, not in rail transport, there's only one railway, a couple of railways in, in Greece, uh, or in, uh, in air transport, but they're interested in sea transport. Why? Not only for connections with, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with the islands, but because of the very strong um, shipping industry in in uh, in uh, Greece. Just think of the dynasties of Onassis, Nyarkos, these very big uh, uh, shipbuilders, world players, and they're obviously they're very interested in the sort of the maritime transport policies of the European Union. So obviously, when we look at maritime policies, transport of goods, we shall keep an eye on what the interests of Greece are. While other countries are much more interested in other forms of transport, it could be transport, uh, rail transport or uh, road transport and so on. And so we will consider that. So at the end, as in any union, they, you somehow find a balance of the interests. And so you generally find a package uh, which satisfies everybody. So it is, although the, uh, the unanimity has been removed. We find that, generally speaking, there are, the, the, the European Union has been moving in a rather coordinated uh, and uh, and the united way of deciding um, policies and rules in the field of transport. Now, this is the first uh, part of the of the introduction. Are there any questions? Galea, a police, a Sayag, sorry, it is a way of the advantage of you being a few. I sort of, <laughs> I generally, when, you know, when you're 15, it takes me a couple of days before I, I get to know everybody, but uh, having this small class, it's, uh, it's much easier. Any, any questions? No. Then, now, this is, I mean, European transport law is one of the many areas of you could one could look at European energy law or a European um, pharmaceutical law. You could, uh, but uh, I just would like to remind you that uh, we as lawyers, especially if we come from sort of countries which have uh, sort of a legislative background 
Although Malta, well, we can have a nice discussion of where we place Malta, but anyhow, Malta has a system by which uh, the sort of legislation is very important. And sort of we look at, generally tend to look, the first thing we tend to look at legislation. Anyhow, we're talking of regulation. So obviously we're looking at regulations. So what we do is surely we will look at the law, what the law says, whether it is a primary text treaty on the function of the European Union, or a directive, a regulation, or some kind of secondary legislation. So surely we will look at that. Now we've looked at the primary sources, the Rome Treaty or the Lisbon Treaty. But at the same time, we always look, whatever the field, whether we are looking at, let's, countries which have a civil code, we look at the text of the, the rule, whether it is there, has been there for 216 years, or it has been there for much less time. We shall see what the article so and so says. But at the same time, we shall look at what case law, what the courts have decided. It is impossible for us as lawyers, as contemporary lawyers, to look only at the what the text says. This is what someone who is not a lawyer, someone who is not a lawyer takes the text of the law and says, the law says this. We as lawyers, you as prospective lawyers, graduates in, in law, know already, should know already that you look at the text, but you must see how this text has been interpreted and how it has been applied in one case, in many cases, and constantly. So the, role of precedent. To what extent case law has somehow changed or supplemented uh, the meaning of what the rule says on its face value. Text of the law says something. How do we interpret this? We lawyers pass our time interpreting. Obviously, if I'm on one side, I will interpret it in the interest of one side. Someone is on the other side will interpret it in the interest of another side. I mean, it is the nice thing of the law that, but fortunately, it's not dogmatic. It's not, there's never a one and only one solution. There are various solutions that change according to the circumstances, the parties, and so on. And so it is an exercise of uh, sort of, of tolerance, the fact of, of legal interpretation, the fact that I could have a certain interpretation and Ms. Calea might have a different kind of interpretation, and uh, Apolis or Asayag have a different interpretation. And none of these are per se wrong, well, unless there is some court, some judicial authority that says this is the way it should be interpreted. And then obviously we must, we depend on what the courts decide. Now, why did I make this uh, short brief uh, excursus, simply because if we look, if we were looking at the Rome Treaty, said, hey, there's nothing to do. What, what are we talking about? There's nothing. It, it says, well, non-discrimination, it applies only to, uh, to um, road, rail, and inland waterways. Uh, Malta, Malta is not interested. We don't have railroads. We don't have inland waterways. Well, there's, well, we have road, yes, but the small country, so it's quite simple. So what are we discussing about? And because the sea, which is, we are an island and we are interested, and, and if we want to move rapidly, we need air, so it's nothing, there's nothing to do. Point is that those, that text that I've read from 74, we have seen from 74 to 84, have been, they were like this, they've been overturned by the courts. And the courts is not the courts by one court, which is the European Court of Justice. And this is the uh, interest, and it shows how you clearly the intentions of uh, the, those who frame the, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 um, the, the Rome Treaty, uh, De Gasperi, Adenauer, Schumann, um, Spack, they were sort of, they, they had a and obviously the governments that were behind them had a very clear idea that transport had to be kept out 
of uh, sort of the liberalization and freedom to provide services. Unfortunately, unfortunately, well, from that, from this point of view, the sort of the European Court of Justice did not have the same opinion and had a different opinion. And so what our political intentions are very important. We will uh, analyze them as historians if we are interested in history, but as lawyers, then we have to look at what the courts decide. And now what do we see is that we find in, it's very slow, in 1974 and then in 1986, two fundamental decisions uh, taken by the European um, Court of Justice um, and which completely changed the scenario of that we have seen. And change, it was, it was white and it's turned into black or vice versa. Uh, you should consider that it takes a considerable time. The first decision is 1974, which means, well, as you can see, it's 17 years after the, um, the, the Rome Treaty and the real one, the Nouvelle Frontier decision of 1986 is, well, nearly 30 years later. But they have uh, profound uh, consequences on the whole European uh, Union, um, that time European Community Transport Law, and changed the, the system completely. Um, just to remind you, uh, and this is also for um, a police who has not taken European Union law, what is the role of the European Court of Justice? The European Court of Justice has two roles. The first is to solve conflicts between uh, substantially the commission and the member state. Typically member states, typically if the member states have not um, uh, implemented some kind of uh, European Union, European community or European Union regulation. So the commission brings a case against the the state and says it brings it in front of the court and says you have not respected you are not respecting EU law and uh, therefore it is uh, you are uh, I want you the court to decide if that country has uh, followed the rules of the uh, European of the Rome Treaty at that time or not um, and this is the first function so this this is a typical conflict the Commission against Generally, it's mostly the commission against a member state. <coughs> Sometimes, rarely, there's a member state against the commission, but historically, many of the cases have always been brought by the commission against a member state because the member state has not uh, correctly transposed, implemented uh, some kind of rule re directive or regulation of the European community or the European Union. This is the first role. The second role is that of so so-called preliminary rulings, which you will find that in the appendix of the of the handbook that you have 300 pages of those there are about 30 decisions there about these 30 decisions 25 are preliminary rulings. So what is a preliminary ruling? A case appears in a national court um, among the issues that are raised. There is the conflict, the possible conflict between a national law, a domestic law, and a European Union, community or union law. And the court, it could be a first instance appeal or the highest court, is in doubt, doesn't, doesn't, isn't, doesn't know clearly what to apply or how to interpret correctly the uh, European Union law. So what does he do? It suspends the trial. It refers the question or the questions to the European Court of Justice. The European Court of Justice provides a preliminary ruling and says, Article 5 of Regulation Number 242 of 1995 must be interpreted in this way. So it provides the authentic interpretation of this, of the, of that piece of European legislation. So what do we 
fine, we find an interim decision. So there's a case in front of a domestic court, the case is suspended, the uh, case is sent, the questions are sent to the Europe, to the Luxembourg court. The Luxembourg court provides its interpretation. The case goes back to the domestic court, which must follow the interpretation given by the European Court of Justice. There's, however, one very important aspect that I would like to point to you, and which is uh, fundamental in the balance of powers of the European Union. The decisions of the European Court of Justice, or as it is called now, the Court of Justice of the European Union, are not valid only in the specific case. So the interpretation that the European Court of Justice provides is not valid only for that judge in that case. It is valid not only for that jurisdiction. Let's imagine it's an Italian court that has raised, judge that has raised the case, or a French one, or Maltese that has raised the case. Only for that jurisdiction, it is valid for all the courts of the member states. So it is, it is yes, a judicial decision, but it has a quasi-legislative effect. That means that the all member states, whether we are talking of legislators, administrations, courts, when facing that specific topic, which is disciplined by an EU regulation, they must follow that interpretation provided by the European Court of Justice. Let's imagine in this case that we are analyzing, it is a case that is raised with France. Well, but this is valid. The principle that is expressed is valid for any member state. It is not valid only for France. So just to point out that these decisions are very, have a vast reaching because they do not apply only to that case, to that jurisdiction, but to the whole European uh, legal order. So it is when they take these decisions, they are very, very important. And we as lawyers, at least if we have to do, especially if we have to do with regulations, some kind of regulation, and there's very few areas which are not subject to EU law, we necessarily have to ask ourselves, is there by chance a decision of the European Court of Justice on this specific topic that gives us a certain uh, interpretation? Yesterday was a decision of the European Court of Justice on the establishment of universities in Hungary. And it, why is it interested? Does it concern only Hungary? No, it concerns any member state of the European Union because there's very interested application of international trade law. So the principles that the Court of Justice has established in the field of uh, university services, uh, university uh, are service. So it has to do somehow with the provision freedom to provide services. It says, well, listen, you must, uh, we also have to look at the WTO, World Trade Organization, a general agreement on trade and services. So just to point out, it's not something that interests only that sort of who cares about Hungary. No, it interests us, uh, anybody, whether you are in Finland or you are in Malta, whether you, you are in Portugal or in Cyprus, it interests us all. So just to point out why we will focus so much on decisions of the European Court of Justice, because they have opened the road to a different system, legal and economic system in uh, um, uh, European transport law, and obviously they are um, very important for us lawyers because they make us understand what is the sense of certain provisions. When we interpret the provision, well, now we interpret them according to the uh, to the principles that have been set out by the European Court of Justice. So, what is the I'll just start with this case, then I'll come to the Nouvelle Frontier case. This is takes it starts pretty far away, and apparently it has to do um, only incidentally with what we are talking about. But the Court of Justice is takes advantage. All courts generally take advantage of this case to somehow put uh, their shoe in the door. They don't close the door; they leave it ajar, and then they 
progressively open. This is exactly what happened. In this case, this so-called French Seaman case was uh, sort of the court um, took a certain decision and um, which was quite easy to take and left the door open ajar for subsequent decisions, which eventually did take. So, in this case, 1974, what was the principle? There was um, in a rule in the French Maritime Code, a rule that went back to some ordonnance of 17th century. So, so French maritime law was somehow codified in the 17th century, uh, which established, and this rule went on, which established that in sort of in ships that were flying French flag, only French citizens could be employed as seamen. So there was a French fl uh, ship flying French flag, only Frenchmen. So it's, if you were from another country, well, you could not have, a company could say, oh, no, very much, sure, no, we're, we're not going to give you a job because you come from another country. Oh, but I'm a very able seaman, not interested. You're not French. Now, obviously, this uh, created, uh, you can easily imagine that the, sort of it is, um, sort of think of the principle of freedom of movement of workers. So you're, you sort of, you are a worker, a seaman, and you want to work on for a certain company, you're told, no, sorry very much, you cannot, um, you cannot work because you're not a citizen of this, of this uh, country. Clearly behind this, if I may say so, the trade unions were very strong because trade unions were protecting their own workers and unionized workers. And they said, oh, well, we're not interested in, we don't want foreigners coming uh, to take the job. Um, clearly, uh, this had a um, certain amount of effects on, um, on the principle of transport on seamen, but had to do mostly was not so much freedom to provide services, but freedom to uh, freedom of movement of of uh, workers. Uh, as a matter of fact, not only uh, France case arose in France, but other countries joined France, saying, "Oh well, we want to apply the same rule. Our ships are seamen." So substantially, if you look at this from an economic point of view, segmenting uh, the uh, workmen's uh, workforce uh, markets. So Italians can find, Italian seamen can find job only in Italy, French only in France and so on. So it, it's a segmentation of markets and preventing uh, sort of that movement of workers from one country to another. Obviously the argument that the French government and other governments brought uh, was, hey, Article 84, second paragraph said, all right, first paragraph says that it applies to only to rail, road, and inland waterways. And it says, if we want to set rules in the field of sea transport, you need an unanimous, unanimous decision. Is there a unanimous decision? No. Then this is left to the member states. And so in France, we do just as we want. And in Italy and other countries, we do whatever we want. The Court of Justice did not have the same opinion. So, and the argument, obviously, take this. If we have to analyze this argument from a strictly logical perspective, we could say there's some logical flaws in the argument of the Court of Justice. But this is quite irrelevant. There's a Latin expression which says, Roma locuta causa finita. Roma meaning the sort of the, when the case is brought in front of the highest court in Rome, well, the case is closed. So you're not getting, we're not gonna discuss it. So once the decision is taken by the European Court of Justice, we can say, oh, they are wrong. They haven't understood anything. They have misapplied the law, but that is the law. The law has changed and the law has been changed by the courts. So as you see here, the quote from the 
from the paragraph 31 and 32 of the, of the decision, uh, since transport is basically a service, it has been found necessary to provide a special system for it, taking into account the special aspects of this branch of activity. Okay, so it's special, and so we will take into account. But far from excluding the application of the treaty to these matters, Article 84 provides only that the special provisions of the title relating to transport shall not automatically apply to sea and air transport sectors. Whilst under that article, therefore, sea and air transport, so long as the council has not decided otherwise, is excluded from the rules of the title relating to common transport policy. It remains on the same basis as other modes of transport, subject to the general rules of the treaty. So what does this mean? It is capsizing, putting inside out the principle that was established in Article 61 of the Rome Treaty and in Articles 74 to 84. What does the court say? Yeah, okay. The council unanimously decides. But this does not mean that the rest, all the other provisions of the treaty apply, do not apply to, uh, the, um, uh, to sea transport. Particularly, they said, well, Article 61 is concerns freedom to provide services. Here, yeah, we are not talking of freedom to provide services. We are talking of freedom of movement of workers. So if a, a worker coming from a member state at that time, 74, I think we were not more than 10 member states, uh, wants to uh, be employed by a French, um, uh, by a French sea company, maritime company, he or she cannot be discriminated. So uh, it was quite easy for the court in that time to say, oh, we're not, it's not problem, it's not Article 61 freedom to provide specific rules to provide um, uh, services. Just let me go back to Article 61, freedom to provide services in the field of transport shall be governed by the provisions of the title relating to transport. The court said, well, this is not an issue of freedom to provide services. This is freedom of movement of workers. Why should a seaman be discriminated, sort of an Italian or, I don't know if it was a Belgium, someone from Belgium or the Netherlands who want to be employed in a French in, a maritime company and was told, no, sorry very much, you cannot be. So he said, no, well, this is not a problem of services. It's a problem of freedom to provide, uh, freedom uh, of movement of workers. So it was not too difficult, but the whole idea was to say, well, there is an exception, but the, this exception does not mean that the general rules of the treaty apply to so this is the first decision, 1974, which subsequently will be vastly open. So the door was left open, and after 12 years, we should see this tomorrow, will substantially the door will be nearly completely open. Not entirely, but you know, practically open significantly. So we shall see how this process works. So what seemed to be a very closed system and full powers to national to member states to their legislation well from 1974 onwards starts changing and i will for today i will stop here other questions is it sufficiently clear for you uh, listen, I, I will be sending you the slides, but I generally do what I do. I send them on a weekly basis. So I will be sending them at the, so this weekend, I will be sending you the slides that we have uh, done during the, um, during the, during the, these free classes. And uh, uh, then I will be also giving you the link to the, I'm a set up a YouTube a channel. So if, so 
sort of you would have at night, you sort of you have, you have insomnia and say, hey, I want to see this lesson again. Well, you'll find it, you can find it on YouTube. I hope you have something more more pleasant to do. But anyhow, it will be, it will be, it, I will be putting them on, on, on YouTube and so on. Thank you so much. Hmm? Okay, then goodbye and see you tomorrow. Um, two, a quarter past two. Uh, I've kept the same times of the in presence lessons. Why? Because when sort of substantially you, the previous lesson ended at quarter to two and that left half an hour for the students to have a, a break and eat something. Now that obviously you are at home and it's, things are easier. But anyhow, I will start tomorrow on lessons on Thursday and Friday are from quarter past two to five o'clock. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.